Okay, so first I'd like to thank uh, actually all the uh, foreign invited speaker and also participants to join this uh, wonderful workshop by help, help in Taiwan annually. Okay, so today I'd like to talk about uh, some work which I put out like a couple of days ago with uh, Tatsuma Nishioka who just spoke and uh, also our student uh, Nong Shen Chen and uh, Nozomo Kobayashi. So I guess uh, this can be regarded as uh, probably like first in a series of work we are embarking on trying to understand uh, in more detail about some of the defining uh, building blocks in the Lorentzian conformal field theory and the holographic duo and recently catching up uh, more of the interest. So this is the first work and uh, check the details there. Um, so the building block we're going to look at today is what's known as the OPE block. And this thing is actually uh, coming from the very early days of a conformal field theory. And uh, this was introduced, was introduced uh, by I guess, Ferrara and also, I guess, reviewed in more detail in the famous te textbook of Max. And they can regard this as a, some kind of fancy way to uh, package when you take a two of the primary operator and uh, they're lab usually labeled by their scaling dimension and spin, which I use to suppress in that I and J. And take the OPE, and then we know that we usually have to right, rewrite it in terms of some of the other primary operators in our theory, and the plus uh, their infinite number of descendants. So if you package them together, and uh, we can introduce this uh, bilocal operator, which we call the, uh, so it depends on x1, x2, and uh, this is called uh, the OPE block. And the essential feature of this OP block is that this is entirely kinematical. It's only fixed by our conformal uh, symmetry. So basically, in today's class, we we'll eventually want to need to think about right, construct a Lorentzian version of this thing, and also to give a holographic interpretation of what those things can be. So let's start it with something more familiar, like the Euclidean conformal field theory. So to extract the explicit form of the uh, the Euclidean OPE block. So here we are working in the so-called embedding formalism that the P1 and P2 here are really uh, uh, basically position vectors uh, in the embedding space for the Euclid D-dimensional Euclidean CFT, which is a D plus 2-dimensional uh, Minkowski space. So we are looking at M1 comma D plus 1. And we can extract it. So what can, this has a various advantage, which I won't uh, address too much. You can ask me later. But the point is that we introduce something known as a shadow projector, which is basically a, uh, if you want, it's actually like a defining a, uh, like in quantum mechanics, we can define a bra and cap, which allow us to actually project it out precisely. Those are play and raw eigenvector to project it uh, in, this, uh, 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 in this summation to precisely uh, the term correspond to a given uh, primary operator. So, so, so here, this, this guy is uh, so given the primary operator delta j, and uh, this guy is a shadow, and it defines through the, uh, a kind of non-local uh, transformation, which, be, which basically allows you to write it in the, uh, uh, the whole thing to become a conformal integral. So if this guy has a scaling dimension delta, this guy has to have a scaling dimension d minus delta to cancel here, so the whole thing is actually invariant. So in order to define such an integral, uh, such an operator, this is what we call a shadow operator, then we have to basically use the following uh, kernel. There's almost no uh, ambiguity here again now. And they basically take a, a local primary op operator, integrate with respect uh, to this kernel with the compensating scaling dimension delta bar, which defines to be d minus delta, and smear over 
uh, the entire uh, space time you are considering. And the D here just basically consider the uh, spin here, there are additional things for you to perform a contraction over all these tensor indices. Good. So once we define this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, shadow projector, when we contract it uh, with the OPE block, then we basically pin down the precise uh, primary operator. We are considering all its contribution to the uh, the left hand side of the operator product I mentioned, and then we can write the uh, the whole thing in the following form. And here we introduce the uh, the normalized Euclidean three point function. So we are considering relatively general cases. Now we take the two uh, external operators, the big scalar, but in general, when they exchange, then they can also have a, a, a primary operator carry a non-trivial spin. <coughs> only in, this, in this case, you only have a symmetric traceless representation. And this is a unique form of the scalar-scalar uh, uh, tensor, a three-point function, which precisely fits by the conformal uh, symmetry. And then we have removed the, uh, the OPE coefficient with this it was not fixed here. So, uh, okay, so now in order to, so this is kind of our starting point to look for the Euclidean, uh, the holographic interpretation for the Euclidean OPE block. So to do so, uh, we can think about, uh, for example, just take the, uh, the, the term which depends on the, uh, the internal coordinate, that is the coordinate being changed, the P0 here, and we can use the Feynman reparameterization to uh, combine those terms, and we've learned from elementary quantum field theory that we can rewrite. So we use a particular one, the new parameter. And we can rewrite the whole, uh, this product, into a following form. And B, B here is basically a beta function. What's interesting is this uh, combined coordinate we introduce x lambda. So for some of you who learn anything about embedding space coordinate, that we know, OK, the individual. Uh, uh, P1 and P2, which correspond to the uh, location of the primary operator living on a light bulb. Therefore, P squared equals to zero. But when we combine them together, uh, which are arbitrized by this uh, integration variable lambda, depends on this combined coordinate satisfied trivially this condition that x squared equals to minus one. Or in other words, this coordinate describes a surface uh, inside the uh, uh, m1 comma d plus one uh, Minkowski space, but with a uh, negative curvature, and this is nothing for the ADS uh, d minus well, d minus d plus one dimension ADS space. So, with this uh, interpretation, well, with uh, recognizing this, then we can actually rewrite the uh, the Euclidean OP flow which was fixed kinematically into the following form. And then we immediately recognize that uh, these two guys are precisely the uh, the bound to boundary propagator uh, for a scalar uh, field, and they're basically talking to its uh, uh, ADS scalar dual, scalar primary, <coughs> and it's uh, talking to communicate with the uh, ADS scalar dual. And uh, then there was remaining here is another well, tensor uh, bound to boundary propagator, but now uh, the field actually carry the scaling dimension uh, delta bar, or sometimes I would call it shadow uh, 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 that, that, that dimension. And then in fact, this tensor structure here, we can construct it by considering precisely an interaction vertices in ADS involving the scalar, scalar, and the tensor field. And then you will introduce the appropriate uh, derivative uh, to saturate all the indices. So, so basically what's really happening here is that so from this a very simple uh, realization that we can, for example, try to recover some of the uh, results uh, proposed in the literature by Bata Chek and the De Boyer and uh, I think De Kunha and Guica uh, around 2006, what they had for the uh, OPE block. So more precisely speaking, what they did was in the Laurentian, which we're going to recover later as well. But we are looking at, the, in this simple discussion, now we are looking at the Euclidean version of this game. And the, so their proposal basically goes as follows. They were looking at the, the scalar case. So we basically take the j to be 0. And basically, the integral we had just now reduces into the following uh, form. Now, so here we introduce this guy, capital <coughs> phi. 
which is nothing but uh, something called an HKLL uh, representation of a scalar uh, field inside the ADS space. And uh, just think about this guy, it's really that you can just, uh, it's really just re 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 explicitly writing down the ADS CFT law that we usually think about a bulk field is going to be sourced by a boundary uh, primary operator. And they need to talk to each other, and then the way they communicate with each other is precisely through a uh, bound to boundary uh, propagator. But which one? Well, this guy contains a scaling dimension uh, actually trivial, but this is actually does not have a, uh, 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 any dimension at all. So that means we actually have to compensate to, to kill this, uh, this uh, 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 guy at the dimension delta. And so that's precisely the shadow and the smear over the boundary. And uh, originally, what uh, HKIL stands for Hamilton, Kabat, and the Lipschitz, and uh, I can't remember where, ah, no, yeah, David Lowe. What they did was instead, they actually tried to actually solve for the, uh, the ADS uh, scalar uh, Laplace equation, and then they tried to make their performance very harmonic, and they integrate uh, over the uh, uh, basically the boundary well, they fix the radial coordinate and integrate over the boundary coordinate to recover uh, this form. But more or less, if well, but this thing is something should be fixed again just purely by uh, the kinematic. So this is what we recover, and this is precisely uh, what uh, Bonacher and the boy and other people were proposing us in a more um, uh, in other from, from other perspective. In fact, on the entanglement. Of the um, usefulness of those OP blocks. So, for the uh, for the non-trivial uh, spin case, then we can interpret it. Basically, this uh, we, what we notice is that this uh, uh, tensor structure can actually be rewritten in the following form, where the x lambda is the uh, basically the, the the coordinate inside the ADS parametrizing a dual distance. In fact, I should really have emphasized earlier that this x lambda here. Uh, we introduced earlier as a precise interpretation. It's not only inside ADS, according to inside ADS, but it's really parametrized in the geodesic, connecting the two external points, P1 and P2, and the line parameter here is precisely the, uh, the lambda. So, and this tensor structure, we can rewrite it into uh, the x and dot it with uh, basically the dx by the lambda as an tangent vector to the geodesic and uh, contract it with this tensor structure, uh, C0. And uh, this allows us to rewrite uh, the entire spinning uh, OPE block, which is a generalization, temperature generalization to the scalar case in the previous literature. That, again, we have a very uh, simple expression that now we have this uh, 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 spinning generalization of the HKLL result, and they are integrate uh, along the geodesic uh, which is exactly the same kernel as what we had before for the scalar one. And this is something we recovered on all the kind of kickoff point for our uh, paper to investigate this kind of thing. And this phi e here is the, uh, if you want, the spinning generalization. And the here k here is a spinning bound to, uh, boundary uh, uh, propagator uh, inside the ADS space. So a couple of features to comment on before we move to Euclidean case is that first, uh, if we really <coughs> expand it out, uh, what's up here in the, uh, so we change the polarization, so here Z0 here plays the role of polarization vector, and but now we have to contract it as additional tensor. So some of you uh, know anything about the embedding space coordinate, both the ADS and uh, the, uh, for the RD, you would say, well, okay, so if you expanded this guy out, and uh, now you have this additional x dependent, which depends on the, uh, the ADS coordinate, and when we project it uh, back to the physical space, then this thing projects to exactly the same value because dx uh, by d lambda, well, dx by small x dot x is zero. And indeed, this is somewhat, uh, the reason why we keep this term is actually trying to preserve the shift symmetry in the bulk when we shift the those polarization uh, vector. However, actually those explicit x-dependent, all this term, and if you raise the power j by binomial, and you have all this uh, x-dependent term, can actually be packaged into a uh, total derivative type of form. And uh, when we impose that, so we will perform a, 
uh, integration by part, and uh, that is the total derivative with respect to the, uh, the coordinate uh, P0 to actually act on uh, the boundary field, the O here, instead. So that means if we impose a conservation law, uh, basically if, if, we, if we set the, uh, the boundary Feynman operator to be a conserved field, all this naked X dependent completely drop off. And uh, we recover uh, precisely the same result as what people have earlier uh, when they consider the spinning version uh, of the HKLL. There was a paper which I'm going to quote data by Kabai and his student, and they work on uh, also, in fact, Kabai himself, and this is also did for the vector case. So, to summarize uh, what's happening in the Euclidean case is that uh, the picture is uh, in this cartoon. So, basically, the OPE block. It's nothing but when you consider uh, the, uh, what's a good way to say it? Yeah, if you consider the, uh, the ADS dual of a whichever primary operator that's being changed uh, associated with this OP block, its ADS dual rewrite it in the HKL representation, then integrate along the geodesic connecting the two boundary points and uh, uh, weighted by this uh, measure, which really just corresponds to two external leg attaching to it. So this is a very clean picture. And uh, also, this naturally connects to something I did earlier about the geodesic with diagram, is that people, when they think about uh, OP blocks, they to take a, two copies of those and uh, forming, quote, unquote, two-point function. It's, it's really the four points. Now, you can rewrite this integral uh, into the following. And the people say that this must give you a proportional to uh, the conformal block. Sure, because this thing, when you now project it reading an ADS-CFT, this corresponds to this picture. And this two guys is nothing but the, uh, the Euclidean uh, version of a bulk-to-bulk propagator. Uh, it's a spin J restricting to propagate along uh, the two geodesic connecting the two boundary points, P1, P2, and P3, P4. And so this is all, um, in fact, I can prove from a pictorial. So, and indeed, uh, uh, why should I mention earlier that when constructing those uh, 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 OPE blocks, we have to in we introduce this uh, shadow uh, uh, operator, the CFT, and uh, the dual uh, configuration, uh, in, well, dual operation, I should say, what is a shadow operator. Shadow transform shadow projector is precisely uh, what's called a split representation, and that will allow you to basically express uh, the 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 bound to bound propagator into bound to boundary propagator, or essentially cut off the the geodesic uh, uh, with a diagram into the two copy, and that's something we and in fact that's what and it brings all the external point all the point on shell, so you can really start it from uh, three-point function and they kind of glue your way out that uh, exactly how you construct the, uh, the higher point uh, function in CFT by basically attaching uh, the three-point function together and give appropriate OPE coefficient and so on. And this is something we did to prove the validity of this uh, general geodesic with diagram earlier with uh, 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 Kyono, Deki Kyono, Kyoto and then my former student, Henry Ko. So yeah, sometimes that's why people say, yeah, the OPE block is like a half of the conform block, or holographically, this is like a half of the uh, four-point um, geodesic with that diagram. OK, very good. So that's for the Euclidean case. Now we want to push to the Lorentzian case. Then you will say, yeah, OK, let's close our eyes and uh, just analytically continue to the Lorentzian case. And in fact, in the recent study of ADA-CFT, we know, actually, this might be too naive. If I can give numerous examples in the case of, for example, conformal block, and so on. So we want to be more careful than that. So OK, so there are basically three issues in pushing on Lorentzian to Euclidean. First is that, OK, so in the Lorentzian case, of course, we need to think about space time and timeline cases. So how is that going to change the integration for the exchange point, I mean, here we we coming back to the physical space forward. How is that going to change the integration region for each of those cases? Second, basically, when we contract the 
uh, after we done the contraction in premium cases, essentially the integration kernel was the three-point function, the, uh, the normalized three-point function, and uh, we integrate with uh, the original operator. All right, so now in the Lorentzian case, which CFP? Which three-point function? So which CFP three-point function? Could it be white band, or do we need to consider the time ordering case? And finally, uh, for each of those space-like timeline cases, do we have to um, modify the definition of our bulk field? Right? I mean, I mean, I'm saying that do we have to modify the HKLL uh, representation? And if I have a space-like case, we will see later on it's almost like Euclidean. That fits your intuition, right? If the space I separated x1, x1, space I separated easily define a geodesic. What about timeline? Or if the intermediate case, the line line would be the most interesting. So that's the one of the reasons we want to systematically study those kind of objects. And the reason for doing this, another uh, motivation, that's something we are starting to look at, is that since those guys were supposed to be building block even for, at least in the Euclidean example, that is a building block for the uh, full conformal block, what we really want to ask is that uh, holographically, well, the question, in fact, originally, at least what I wanted to answer was, what are the holographic dual of a various kind of conformal block which appear recently that when people think about the inversion formula that in the Lorentzian CFT that allow you to take the, uh, not only the scaling dimension to be continuous, but spin to be continuous, and there are different degeneracies. And what are those things in ADS? How do we do that? Because that's, this, is, this is the reason why we are looking at this as the first step. Okay, so to answer this, um, it turns out it's quite, it, it, when you think about the problem with causality, it's easier to think about the momentum space instead. And uh, what we really do precisely is that we try to do a Fourier transform of the operator that's being changed in the middle. So we perform the Fourier transform of the O, and uh, we, yeah, we do the Fourier transform. And uh, now we uh, also introduce the time coordinate, and also we can uh, do exactly the same thing with the shadow, and you might recall at least in Euclidean case that shadow, you need to add an, another uh, this uh, 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 two-point uh, function for the shadow operator, and uh, that introduces additional kernel, and when you translate that via the Fourier transform, this becomes the two-point uh, Weichmann function itself can be fixed, again, by solving a conformal uh, word identity. Okay, so I think I should speed up, but we can have some time to talk. So, uh, but anyway, so when we contracted the, this this uh, this uh, shadow projector with the OPE block to obtain a Lorentzian conformal block, now it has uh, three pieces, and uh, the only unknown here is that we have this uh, three-point Weichmann function, which we need to obtain the explicit form, and this is a two-point guy, and this is the, uh, the primary operator living in the momentum space. So. In order to get this guy, uh, we can start it from the Euclidean uh, momentum space three-point function, or more precisely, we only transform the exchange uh, operator by keeping the two external guy remaining in the physical or in the position space. So we can express the answer into uh, what we call the Q kernel, and this is nothing but well, it's a kind of more compact way to rewrite the, uh, the, 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 the answer that where D here is a differential operator which only acts on the external points x1 and x2 and the explicit form D here is given by the Jacobi uh, polynomial of a degree j for the spin j and the rest are just uh, uh, here is the u dependence here is basically the type of geodesic integral that when you, uh, uh, when you do it in the, in the, well, when you do it in the u coordinate and the i here is the vessel i function. So I guess one thing to take away here is that it contains a square root, so it potentially can uh, uh, basically uh, contain a, a branch cut when you consider the momentum space integration. And that branch cut is important because now when we consider, when we, that's the Euclidean guy, and then now we perform the analytic continuation, or more precisely, we do it kind of sneaky way in the sense that we go back to the physical space, and uh, so we Fourier transform back, and uh, now 
uh, perform the analytic continuation, uh, take the xd to ix0, and so on and so on. And uh, we realize that now perform this, uh, uh, the PD integral, this thing actually, uh, this, this integral, basically decay at infinity, that allow us to basically deform the contour along precisely the branch cut associated with the Bessel function, yeah? So we have some kind of double discount, what kind of discontinuity, all we care about is the discontinuity, and this discontinuity can be expressed precisely in terms of our Q kernel, so we obtain the following relation that, so this is the original physical space, Euclidean signature, sorry, Lorentzian signature, y kernel function, and uh, this is Fourier transform, and uh, what's given inside the square bracket here. Plug it back in, and that's the, uh, a representation of the Lorentzian OP plot, which we're going to use. As a sanity check to reproduce everything what was known before, that for the space light, and that's what people have done in the literature, and there is a scalar, the Q kernel we get is the following form, and then we use the relation between the vessel I and vessel J. So to get, to get precise space time interpretation, we notice that there's a cute uh, representation of the vessel function. You can rewrite it into the following form. And uh, we have to restrict the integration uh, region between the uh, coordinate y and uh, the x, the argument. Plug this back in, get the following form. Phi here is nothing but uh, uh, the Lorentzian uh, version of the HKL representation of scalar field originally obtained by uh, well, the HKL. And uh, here we have introduced the uh, uh, this, this, uh, uh, kind of ADS space geodesic coordinate. Good. And uh, for the spin case, again, now we notice we can't, we, so that's considered just the uh, conserved cases. So in the momentum space, that's the conservation condition. And uh, the answer takes the following form. And uh, the phi here is precisely, again, the spin version of the HKL field obtained by uh, Saka and Shao, who were students of the HKL. So, very good. So that's when, yeah, I should emphasize that was the case when the external point x1 and x2 were both space like. So that's a cartoon of what's being uh, down here. Let's just get to the, the final case of the timeline case. So, what's cute here is that, okay, so first when we perform the anti continuation, and then here we consider the case that we one of the operator O1 is in the future light form of the O2. And uh, so when we perform that anti continuation, this boils down to replacing uh, the, 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 uh, the combination of x1 to square in the Euclidean correlation function by the i pi x1 to So for the scalar case, this whole answer, uh, the, 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 the answer is using the Q kernel we introduced earlier. And uh, this basically becomes the following. Here, this is the Bessel I. And we, again, introduce those combination of vector like what we have in the ADS, oh, uh, the, the space I cases, they were ADS coordinate. But here, now we introduce this x mu and uh, this uh, additional direction, uh, chi uh, u. But there's a cute minus sign here. Well, what's going on? OK, let's press a bit further. So we, we basically follow the same recipe as in the space light case and realize that the, the Bessel I here, again, have this kind of representation. Right? This kind of, we can even read this as a Fourier transform. Um, plug it back in, and uh, very good. So we can rewrite these things as an integral just like what we had in HKLL. Provided we, we basically interpret what we are doing properly. And this is how we do it properly. So we realize that the x nu and the chi is no longer in the ADS, but rather it's in, inside a hyperboloid embedded in the, uh, the Lorentzian uh, embedding space of R2, D. Differences between the R1, D plus 1 and R2, D is that when you consider in a boundary a d-dimensional uh, Minkowski space, there are two possible surfaces, or there are two possible extensions as a, surf, hyper, as a hyper surfaces inside the, uh, the box, so to speak. And uh, this case we are looking at, in fact, those coordinates is not like 
Fifty is not going to square root to minus one, but square root plus one. And this geometry is actually obtained from an analytic continuation of a desitta, right? So if uh, here is a Euclidean signature, then it's precisely the desitta space. So we flip one of the direction there to give it time. So you have two time coordinates, so to speak. But that's just give you another way to actually, well, when you end it on the boundary, to give you a uh, 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 basically a Minkowski space. So if you want the two different cases of extending those two surfaces into the into the boundary, precisely correspond to the space line and time line uh, OPE block. And uh, the generalization, the spinning case is almost falling trivial. And the rest of the detail you can find in our paper. So I'll stop here. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll put you in the speaker again.